Well, welcome everybody to today's uh, presentation. My name is Jared Davis. I'm the Vice President of Technical Operations and Manufacturing at Arcturus Therapeutics. And I'm joined today by Graham Brearley, the uh, General Manager of the Madison, Wisconsin facility at Catalan Biologics. And today we are going to be discussing how COVID-19 is reshaping vaccine development innovations in vaccine technology and manufacturing partnerships. And I'm going to be specifically talking about Arcturus's role in this partnership and our work on the lunar COVID-19 vaccine and some of the exciting um, data that we have to date and um, our um, push towards a vaccine. So here's our forward-looking statements. I'll let you review those on your own. Um, on your own time and go on to the next slide. So here's a brief outline of my talk today. So first I'm going to go through a company overview of who Arcturus is. Um, I'll dive into our, our COVID-19 vaccine program and then um, at the end talk about our novel manufacturing uh, processes and construct design and how we're implementing that for our COVID-19 vaccine. So um, just some company highlights. So Arcturus Therapeutics is a clinical stage mRNA medicines and vaccines company. Uh, we're based in San Diego, California with about 90 employees, although growing by the day. Um, we were founded in 2013 and are, are traded um, publicly on NASDAQ. Uh, Arcturus was built on a strong intellectual property and technology portfolio, which now has over 187 patents and patent applications. Uh, these patents are have a wide range of different technologies, but they're focused primarily on our delivery technology, our lunar delivery technology, our mRNA manufacturing and uh, manufacturing processes, including that of our star mRNA, and our drug product uh, manufacturing processes. So Arcturus technologies have been validated by multiple strategic partners, including uh, Johnson & Johnson, who is one of our early partners, Takeda, um, who's been with us for quite some time, Ultragenics, who's focused on rare disease, um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, that's been working with us for the last few years on a CF program, and most recently, uh, the Duke um, NUS Medical School, uh, who's been working with us on our COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, our, our, we have our tourist platform um, and then our pipeline. And first I'll talk about our platform. We use our platform to enable our partners um, and enable our in a variety of different genetic medicines. Uh, so first, as I mentioned, we're working, working with Ultragenics, who's focused on rare disease and primarily rare liver disease. Um, and so we have two programs with, one, with them, one which is our glycogen storage disease type three. Uh, it's an mRNA uh, that is delivered to uh, the hepatocytes of the liver, um, and there's a target IND in 2021. So this is moving all, all along quite well. Uh, the second program is undisclosed with Ultragenics. We have a program with Johnson & Johnson focused on hepatitis B, um, and this is in preclinical stage and also focused on hepatocytes. With Takeda, we're working on a NASH program, and this is unique in that it is um, not the hepatocytes in the liver, but we're actually going to the stellate cells in the liver. And so those of you that may be familiar with LMP technologies, primarily LMPs are are delivered to the hepatocytes, but we've tweaked our formulation um, and been able to deliver specifically to stellate cells for this program. And then we have a number of other um, uh, programs that we are enabling uh, in the, the vaccine space, both in um, pharma health as well as uh, large animal health. So these partnerships um, represent greater than 1 billion in potential milestones and royalties. Um, we're enabling multiple different RNA types, messenger RNA, gene editing RNA, and replicon RNA. And we're looking at multiple different cell types. So moving to our internal pipeline, we have um, our, our lead program, which is Lunar OTC, which is focused on ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. We have enabled INDs, uh, enable IND and a CTA. Our IND is in the US to enable our phase 1B trial and our our CTA is in New Zealand to enable our phase, um, a phase one trial there. This is an intravenous delivery and um, targeting the, or, uh, the, the liver and ha hepatocytes in the liver. Our next program, which is gonna be the focus of this talk is our lunar um, COVID-19 program. So this is a for COVID-19 vaccine. This is an IM delivery um, targeting myocytes and dendritic cells. 
and then I do want to also highlight our program with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, um, and we are targeting an IND in 2020, um, and that's an inhaled aerosol. So you can see that we're we're looking at multiple routes of delivery um, to multiple different cell types uh, with our internal programs as well as with our partners. So now diving into our lunar COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, why why were we interested? Why did we think that we had um, the technology to dive into a lunar COVID-19 vaccine. And it really came down to our platform technologies that we had in place. So we had already validated a, our STAR mRNA platform. Um, and it's a, it's a self-replicating mRNA, mRNA, not a conventional mRNA. Um, and we had our lunar delivery, which we knew was very effective at delivering IM. And we had shown with multiple other um, preclinical vaccine programs that we had, we were able to very um, effectively deliver an antigen and express that antigen in the myocytes. Um, and on top of that, we had a novel manufacturing process for both our mRNA drug substance and drug product that led us to believe that we could scale up very quickly. Um, so what's the difference between a replicon versus a standard mRNA? So a standard mRNA, when it is delivered into the cell, um, as you can see on the left here, um, each, each mRNA is encapsulated into a lipid nanoparticle. And as it goes into the endosome and is released into the cell, you have one mRNA, which then can be translated by the ribosome to make your protein of interest. In this case, an antigen um, or, this antigen, or the spike protein for COVID-19. Uh, however, with our replicating um, mRNA or our star mRNA, when that is delivered into the cytosol, um, you make multiple copies of that rep self-replicating mRNA, which can make multiple copies of the transgene that encodes for the, um, uh, the that encodes for the antigen, in this case, a spike protein. And so you have multiple copies now from a single copy of mRNA, and that allows us to dose much lower and gives us a different um, uh, transgene expression than you have with mRNA. And I'll show some, some, some data that shows that. So we had uh, what we believed was a vaccine that would have significant advantages. One, we could go to very, very low dose, um, combining both our star technology and our lunar technology, um, meaning that we could potentially vaccinate uh, many more people uh, from an individual batch. Uh, also, we, we believed that we could potentially go to a single shot. Um, um, this would give us simple logistics for vaccinating large populations. Um, we also, again, knew that we could get higher protein expression. I'll show some data on this where we see more than 30x more protein produced than a standard mRNA with our star mRNA. Um, and we got much longer expression, and I'll show that data as well. Um, our vaccines don't contain any um, viruses or viral material, um, and they're readily manufactured. So here's some data that we generated early on using our, our star mRNA platform. Um, this is a luciferase. In this case, the star mRNA is, is um, encoding for luciferase. So this is a luciferase study. Um, and if you see, as you see on the left, um, these mice were injected intramuscularly on both flanks um, with either a star mRNA encoding for luc luciferase or a standard mRNA encoding for luciferase. And you can see that we got much higher expression with the star mRNA. And on the graph on the right, you can see that not only do we have higher expression, but that expression has much um, longer half-life. So we see expression all the way out here at seven days, and seven days is higher than what we see at day one. Um, so this, this bodes very well for our vaccine um, and, and suggests that we can get much, not just higher protein expression, but much longer um, longevity. So our, our, if I take a step back to our, our lipid technology, um, we, um, and just kind of how it works. So first of all, our, our mRNA, our star mRNA in this case, is associated with um, for, a four a lipid um, system uh, that encapsulates the mRNA. When that goes into the cell, it enters in through the uh, endocytosis into an endosome. As that endosome ages, you get a change in the acidity of that um, endosome, and then you get, um, pH-mediated um, disruption of the endosome and rapid degradation of the vehicle, re release of the mRNA into the cell. And the efficiency of this process 
is mediated by the lipids used as well as the composition of those lipids. And that's what we've worked very hard here in Arcturus to optimize, to increase the, um, not just the getting into the cells, but getting released out of the endosome and, um, and then having highly integratable um, uh, lipids. So our lipid mediated delivery, we've shown um, through our platform that it's versatile, um, that it's compatible with multiple different mRNA modalities, um, that we have multiple routes of administration, I, IV, IM, and nebulization. We can get to multiple different cell types, um, hepatocytes, stellate cells, myocytes, lung epithelial cells, to name a few. Um, it's biodegradable. We don't see accumulation of lipids. A lot of the LMPs um, uh, that have been introduced in the past, you get accumulation of lipids. With our LMPs, we don't see that. Um, we have a diverse library as well. We have over 150 proprietary lipids that we can choose from. Um, and these were all rationally designed to maximize efficiency and increase tolerability. We then take that library and we have unique formulations customized to our particular application and for our cell type of interest. So for the STAR mRNA, we optimize that for our, the, the cell type of interest in this case. Um, the, in this case, the myocytes. And then we combine that with our manufacturing um, efficiency as well. So we've shown over a broad range of studies that we have our LMPs are safe. Um, we've done over 15 studies with our strategic partners, specifically looking at safety. In one study that we did, we delivered 15 mg per kg in a single dose of a non-coding siRNA, and it was well tolerated. Um, we also did three mg per kg over eight weekly doses of that of a siRNA, non-coding siRNA, for a total of 24 mg per kg over two months, um, and it was well tolerated. In our OTC program, which is um, now, which we haven't allowed IND for, um, we've shown efficacy in the 0.1 to 1 mg per kg range, suggesting that we have a good therapeutic index. Um, and those studies are starting um, shortly. Arcturus is now working with Duke in US and taking all that, that platform knowledge and using that for a vaccine for COVID-19. So we, we, work, we started with them on March 4th of 2020. So that wasn't very long ago. Um, as you can imagine, this, pro, this pro program has started up very quickly and moved very fast. And thanks to Catalan for their support in that. Um, and the reason we're working with Duke in US is because they're an academic world leader in coronavirus and infectious diseases um, and have all the labs necessary to help us along, along the way. This is funded um, by up to, up to $10 million by the government of Singapore. Um, now, some of the benefits of working with Duke in U.S. is that they can help us learn more quickly about the lunar COVID-19 uh, efficacy and safety um, uh, profile through their preclinical models. Um, they can look at specific gene changes and correlate that with efficacy and safety. We can also look at levels of neutralizing antibiotic titers, which we've done, um, and we can also look for potential um, safety-related adverse events, headache and fever, based on the, the genetic changes that they see. And this is based on um, knowledge that they have from past vaccines, where they've looked at gene expressive changes over the first five days. So the data generated with Duke in US um, gives our church the ability to move more efficiently um, and select the dose and streamline our vaccine development program, um, and then accelerating the timeline. So we've generated a lot of data with Duke in US, but this is uh, one set of data that was very promising, uh, early, early data that we generated, very promising, um, where we looked at um, anti-spike glycoprotein IgG antibody titers. Um, and again, this is when we, we introduced the star mRNA that encodes for a spike protein versus a regular mRNA encoding for a spike protein. And we look at the antibody titers against that spike protein over time. So this, in this, study are showing out to 30 days. We've continued this study on, um, but that's not publicly disclosed at this date. Um, but what we've shown is that um, the anti-spike glycoprotein increases um, from day zero to day 30. We see a dose dependence response of those IgG titers. So we've gone from 0.2 microgram, 2 microgram, and 10 microgram doses. We see a dose dependent response. And interestingly, what we see is that, it, and, and actually not surprising based on the expression of our star mRNA, we see that those IgG titers continue to go up after day 10, whereas the mRNA maxes at day 10 and plateaus. Um, uh, 
then this gives us a lot of hope that, that a single dose will be sufficient. But more important than the IgG titers, we wanted to look at seroconversion of these animals. And so we looked at um, seroconversion of the animals at day 10 and day 19, um, and are continuing to look at that, that seroconversion. And what we showed is that a single dose at two micrograms, we got 100% of the animals seroconverted by day 19. So compare that to our conventional mRNA at the same dose, um, where it looked like there might be some animals that were seroconverting at day 10. By day 19, that went away. Um, and only at the 10 microgram dose did we see a significant number of the animals seroconverting. And even at the 0.2 microgram dose, we saw 60% of the animals seroconverting by day 19. At day 30, we used a different method to look at the um, seroconversion. And in this case, we're actually looking at neutralizing antibody titers. And what we see is even at the 0.2 microgram dose at day 30, now we're seeing 80% seroconvert. At the 2 microgram dose, we see 100% of seroconversion. And at the 10 microgram dose, we see um, again 100%. And here I'm showing the antibody titers are 300, greater than 320. That's the dilution that they went to in the lab. Um, and so it's, it's greater than that. We don't know how great these uh, are at this point. We need to do further dilutions. So this is very encouraging data that shows that even at a very low dose, between one and 10 micrograms, we're seeing seroconversion of 100% of the animals tested. One of the big concerns that uh, people had um, originally with these vaccines was the potential for antibody-mediated um, enhancement of the, of the disease. And one way that we, that we can look to, at the potential of this is actually comparing um, both the CD8 um, positive cells and enhancement of IFN um, gamma in those CD8 um, positive cells. And what we saw was that we see a good dose-dependent response of that. And then you want to look to see that you have a balanced response between Th1 and Th2 um, um, uh, the TSU on TSU2 ratio is balanced. And that's what we see. We see greater TH1 over TH2, and we see that that is balanced and not dose dependent, um, suggesting again that we are unlikely to get um, animated, uh, antibody mediated enhancement of the disease from our vaccine. So now uh, in the remaining uh, minutes that I have today, I wanna go into our, our manufacturing, novel manufacturing design and our work with Catalan to very quickly use our platform to produce the mRNA uh, uh, needed for this program. So first, uh, at Arcturus, all of our, our drug substance mRNAs are designed um, rationally. We look at the mRNA sequence, we look at the chemistries we're gonna use, and we look also at processes we're gonna use to make those. And as we look at all of these, we, we look to improve our protein expression, duration of expression, and improve functional activity. And in this early study we did at Arcturus, we showed that our proprietary mRNA optimization platform showed sustained activity upon repeat dose. And this is important because often what you see with some of these mRNAs, if you have an, an, an immunogenic, a negative immunogenic response, you see decrease in the expression over multiple doses. We've also looked at the mRNA manufacturing process from, from beginning to end, from the DNA, the way that we make the DNA, um, IVT uh, and capping reaction, purification process, and then the final fill of our, our mRNA, and look to optimize each of these individual steps. We've optimized our IVT method to reduce our costs, to improve purity, and this is especially important for the um, STAR mRNA, uh, that we optimize this IVT method to improve purities. These very long mRNAs can be challenging to produce. Um, we've improved the capping reaction to reduce cost of goods. One of the concerns that people have around mRNA production is the very high cost, and we've worked very hard to reduce those costs to get them, um, uh, get them in a reasonable level. Um, we have a proprietary uh, purification process that shortens the time in plant, um, and it's a very efficient, making it a very efficient process, so we can do the entire process in less than one week. In fact, the, the phase one, two material that we produced at Catalan, we were in the plant for three days. Um, this is a scalable process. We can scale it to over the kilogram scale, and it's adaptable. We can utilize multiple different modifications. And internally at Arcturus, we have the the capability to make up to 30 grams in one week, but this is all non-GMP. And so this is why we're working um, closely with Catalan to provide GMP material for our clinical trials and future commercial, um, uh, future commercial production. 
So this is just to show that our process is scalable um, and reproducible. This is actually with our OTC program, but it shows the point here. We went from a 0.5 to 10 gram scale here, and we see this, uh, similar yields in the process at each of the individual scales. We see very similar purities as well. Um, and then as we went to our, our GMP lots, uh, which were to the 12 and a half gram scale, we, again, we see very consistent yields and very consistent purities from lot to lot. And we don't see any dependence on scale in either purity or yield. Um, our lunar um, drug product is also optimized to ensure that it is scalable um, as, and reproducible as well. And here we're showing from the 0.1 to 10 gram scale for the lunar um, drug product manufacturing. And here we're looking at two very important parameters. One is particle size. It's important to keep the particle size very consistent. And we see very consistent particle size across all lots produced. And the second is encapsulation of the mRNA. And we see very consistent encapsulation across all scales used. And not only are we consistent here, but we're seeing very high yields. So we're seeing greater than 85% yields for our LMP manufacturing, which is very important um, because of the high cost of, of the mRNA material. And we produced uh, GMP lots of the drug product for our Lunar OTC program, as well as um, uh, for our COVID program that's, that's upcoming. So for our COVID um, CGMP manufacturing, we were working with Catalent and we were able to produce material uh, for the phase one and two phase two clinical programs in Q2 of 2020. So as I mentioned, we, we signed the, the agreement with um, Duke in US in March, uh, the beginning of Q2, and we've completed production also in Q2. So it was a very rapid turnaround, and, and Graham, I think, will talk about this a little bit more, but a very rapid uh, turnaround and really successful and able to, it, it, that we were able to transfer a process and move very quickly on this program. Um, it's important to note that, the, that based on the data we have, we believe the vaccine uh, dose is between one and 10 micrograms RNA. And this and we're planning in the fall to scale up production so that we can supply 30 million vaccine doses from a single lot of RNA in this calendar year working with Catalan. Um, so this would allow us to produce in, in the second half of 2020, 30 million doses from a single lot. Um, and that's due to two things. One, the scalability of the process, but also the low dose that we're able to achieve. And what this means is that we can produce hundreds of millions of doses um, in 2021 and beyond with Catalan as our partner. So I don't need to tell you that uh, we need a solution <laughs> to the COVID-19 vaccine. I think we're all very well aware of that. But it's important to note that there is going to be and continue to be extremely high demand for this vaccine. Um, you know, there's greater than 5 billion people that are going to need to be vaccinated over time. And manufacturing on this scale is unprecedented. Um, and so it is important that we come up with um, multiple solutions. And the Arctura solution is to go to a single shot technology to lower the dose to one to 10 micrograms. So it allows us to get more bang for our buck. Um, so for, for the amount of mRNA used, we're able, to, um, we're able to vaccinate many more people. And so that will allow us to do hundreds of millions of doses in the short term to start to make a dent in the number of vaccines that we need to produce. And uh, with that, I want to thank the Arcturus team and all of their hard work that went into this. We're not a big team, uh, but, but it's been really impressive to work with them and see all the work that they have done. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Graham for the remainder of the discussion today. So with that, thank you, Jared. Really appreciate the uh, discussion. Um, quickly introduce myself. My name is Graham Brealy. I'm the Site General Manager for Madison um, Facility. Um, and I can tell you that on behalf of Catalan, we're very proud to be partnering with Arcturus on this COVID-19 vaccine. Um, the same way that Jared started with a brief company overview, I am going to give a brief overview of uh, Catalan first. Um, Catalan is the world's leading partner in uh, partnering with pharmaceutical, biologic and consumer health innovators in development and delivery technologies clinical logistics, as well as clinical and commercial supply. Um, we have over 40 sites worldwide and 13,000 employees. One of the first things I want to talk about is the patient first culture and mindset that we have in Catalan. Uh, we're very proud that uh, we're able to work on 
therapies that make significant difference in patients' life. And obviously with this COVID uh, pandemic, this is another opportunity for us to, to reach you know, many patients. So I'm going to start here on the biologics network. So biologics is a business unit within Catalunt, and we have multiple sites and I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of them. Our facility in Emeryville, California is where we do our smart tag um, ADC technology. We recently announced an acquisition of master cell um, for cellular therapeutics. We have a facility in Kansas City um, that focuses on uh, analytical development. I'll talk a little bit more about the Madison site um, on the next slide. The Bloomington facility was also an acquisition of Cook Pharmaca. Uh, that's a facility that does process development, analytical development, a lot of formulation, filling, label, packaging. Um, and then we have another test facility in uh, RTP in Morrisville. And then we also have a gene therapy uh, um, capabilities in the Baltimore region through the acquisition of Paragon. In Europe, we have capabilities in France and Belgium and Italy. So I'll focus a little bit now on the Madison site. Um, Madison uh, essentially grew out of a spin-off of the University of Wisconsin with the GPEX technology. This is a gene product expression system, um, high levels of expression. But we have a molecular biology group, we do cell line development, we do process development, we do clinical GMP manufacturing, and we're moving towards commercial manufacturing. We have a small formulation capability in Madison, but that partners really well with the advanced formulation capabilities that we have in Bloomington. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges of getting uh, vaccines to the clinic and to the market. Vaccine development is complex and requires a substantial amount of time and resources. Um, and companies are looking for multiple solutions. You'll hear speed being a common theme throughout this presentation, um, but being fast to clinic at the same time as mitigating risks and keeping a program simple wherever possible. So some of the challenges that arise is when innovative companies are selecting CDMOs, it isn't atypical to see them use one CDMO for their drug substance manufacturing, a different partner for their uh, drug product manufacturing, a different partner for their clinical supply services. And that introduces quite a lot of challenges in terms of qualifying multiple vendors, coordinating the program across different companies, um, and not having a single partner really advocating for your program. Um, and a lot of duplication in these cases. So it's important to prepare for the common delays that can potentially arise. Um, negotiations are key, and clearly if you're negotiating with a single company, that makes uh, things a lot easier. The development work, uh, process development, is very difficult for biologics. Um, and then detect transfer between different sites and between different uh, companies can introduce some challenges. And then the ultimate uh, product disposition, because you have to release the drug substance and release the drug product. If we look at this slide, the top chart is essentially showing a traditional type of um, supply network where you're contracting with the drug substance, you're losing time again in the tech transfer over to the drug product and then again to the clinical supply services. Going with a single provider across all of those does introduce an element of efficiency. Going to a provider that has an integrated solution allows us to reduce the timeline even further. And we'll talk a little bit about that with an offering that Kathleen has called One Bio. And then obviously the global supply chain remains very challenging. Um, as Garrett mentioned, ultimately 5 billion doses are going to be needed across the world and just coordinating the supply chain in terms of the raw materials and then the distribution of product introduces a significant set of challenges. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the partnerships that Catalan has on COVID-19. Um, I think I heard somewhere that there are over 200 COVID programs that are currently being contemplated across the globe. And Catalan is actively engaged on more than half of those in terms of dialogue. 
we've actually signed over 40 programs. Um, we did announce a, a big one with Johnson & Johnson, and then obviously we've uh, done a press release now with our Purathon-based mRNA-based vaccine candidate. Um, there are multiple other programs that are in flight. To talk a little bit about the Madison site, um, we have partnered with the vast majority of biopharmas, farmers and biotechs. Um, we have over a, well over 100 active projects in flight at the moment. The facility in Madison is a little over 180,000 square foot. And as I mentioned earlier, the capabilities are the cell line development, process development, analytical development, some formulation capabilities, and then drug substance. Um, the GPEX technology is well established. There have been over 120 clinical trials that have completed our, or are ongoing that use the GPEX technology. And there are 13 um, licensed products that use GPEX. The facility itself has about 350 employees. Um, we do a lot of monoclonal antibodies, a lot of FC fusions, some fabs, some enzymes, uh, some bioconjugate products, and obviously mRNA. Um, products. COVID-19, the mRNA vaccine candidate that we're talking about today, speed is extremely important and we were already engaged in a program of work with Arcturus when the pandemic really struck and Arcturus wanted to move quickly and pivot and make their um, mRNA um, COVID uh, candidate the um, priority and as Jared said we were able to move extremely quickly. We actually got started on the program before all the contracts were signed off and in place. But in seven weeks from when the contract was signed, we had completed the successful tech transfer into the facility. We had completed a confirmation batch or engineering batch, if you will. And as Jared mentioned, we completed the first GMP batch that actually was released conditionally and shipped to the fill finish site. So let's talk a little bit about shortening timelines. And I mentioned the one bio uh, suite that, uh, that Catalan has, um, a number of advantages for going with a, with a single company with an integrated solution. Reduction in timelines is important on any biologic development program, but particularly important during these COVID pandemic times. Um, a single contract with a single company one quality system, one uh, dedicated program manager overseeing um, the program. So we'll talk about some of the, the time savings. Uh, as mentioned, the single proposal, the reduced negotiations. Um, you can actually parallel process in many cases. Um, and we do have within uh, the biologics network, you know, primarily drug substance in Madison, formulation fill finish label packaging in Bloomington, uh, testing at Kansas and RTP, and then the clinical supply services is another business unit within uh, Catalan, but it's part of this one bio offering. The timelines from going with this can really reduce the, the significantly reduce the time to get from initial drug substance development to actually having clinical product in your uh, clinical uh, studies. I'll give an example of a case study. This is a real one that happened where we were working with a client that was having their master cell bank produced at a, at a, at a different vendor. They were uh, participating with Madison for doing the drug substance with us and then a different vendor for the drug product. And an issue that came up was they had to remake the master cell bank. The first one couldn't be released. As a result of that, we were not able to hold their manufacturing slot for the drug substance. And as a result of that, they actually lost their fill finish. So just that one delay of a month to remaking the master cell bank actually cost the program about 18 weeks uh, in terms of the overall program interruption which we could have avoided if we'd been doing it all in-house. So we did discuss the network a little bit earlier. Um, as I mentioned, we have sites in both US and Europe, uh, and Europe. We also have more than 50 clinical uh, logistics sites and, and depots around the globe. So we're well positioned to be a, a truly global um, offering. 
So final thoughts uh, and an eye to the future. Um, I think what we're seeing is there are different modalities for vaccines, of which obviously this messenger RNA and then the, the program without tourists is a prime example of that. I think we're going to see more of that in the future. We're also starting to see a number of public-private partnerships. Obviously, the U.S. government are funding a number of programs in addition to um, uh, private um, enterprises and VCs. We're seeing greater levels of collaboration than we've ever seen before, um, and we're we're really working with regulatory agencies for what I've seen. I've been in the industry for. 30 years and to see the regulatory agencies approving things as rapidly as they are, hopefully is going to be something that will continue once we get back to the future. So in conclusion, I think companies all over the world are racing to develop a vaccine as we know. Um, the logistics of doing this and the scientific hurdles of to just billions of people are significant. Um, we talk about business as usual, that no longer exists. We will ultimately get to the new normal. I don't know that any of us know exactly what that looks like yet, but I do think that this vaccine development that we're seeing now will pave the way for the future. I think it's obvious that companies understand that their strengths and excel at uh, partnerships and collaborations will stand the best chance um, of success in the future. Okay, so that concludes the presentation for today. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Jared and also to thank everybody for watching.